You are listening to the Archaeology Podcast Network. Just a quick note for episode 24. I may have had a little bit of a cold when we recorded, so if you don't hear me very much or I sound kind of funny, just bear with me. I got better. But thanks everyone for their understanding nonetheless. Ancient tools and burials, plants and seeds, Neanderthals. All these things we make no apology for the study of archaeology. But we don't do dinosaurs. Hey everyone, and welcome to the Archaeological Fantasies Podcast, episode 24. I'm your host, Sarah, with my co-host, Ken Fader. And today, we are interviewing Jeb Carr in the first part of a two-part series. Jeb is with us today to discuss his research into the Mew Stones. He tells us a little bit about his his discovery of the Mew Stones, and a little bit about the analysis that he's having done on them. What he finds out about those Mew Stones, we will hear about in the second part of this series. So stick around to hear the fascinating history of the Mew Stones with Jeb Carr and get ready to think critically. Funny beady blokes you will see are a staple of archaeology but we don't do dinosaurs. Hey everybody and welcome to the Arche- Archaeological Fantasies podcast. I'm your host Sarah with my co-host Ken Fader. Hi Sarah, how are you? Obviously I'm fine. not very good with your voice but that's fine. It's true. This is day three of No Voice so this go. is as good as it gets. Um, and today we have a special ho- uh, special guest with us, uh, Jeb Card, who has been on the show previously. And Jeb is here to tell us about a uh, special project he was working on. And what makes this project interesting is that this is an actual controversy within the field of archaeology. So, Jeb, would you like to give us a little introduction to your project? Uh, hi, and uh, thank you for braving your voice uh, very much. <laughs> um yeah, um, I, I'm not sure how exactly how to start this, but um, I've been working on I, – I was on before, and we talked about a number of archaeological and pseudo-archaeological mysteries and all that, and one quite literally – well, I found it in the basement. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it sounds like a, a horror – that, that sounds like the intro to a horror movie. Um, he found well, it in the basement. Welcome, dun, 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 welcome dun, dun. to every Monday, and I kind of love it actually. But um, – <laughs> Last year, I'm actually going to be teaching this course again in the spring, but last year I was working on a course on culture, art, and artifact and the sort of intersection between the art world and archaeology. And so part of that's iconography and part of that's creativity. But part of that is also collectors. And we used to have an anthropology museum. And that we still have the collections from, and I'm working with that, and that's part of my job. And I was going through our former collections – and sort of figuring out things for my students to work on. And I was going through the paperwork and found a line. A, 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 in fact, I may actually have it next to me. I'll see if I can pull it out. A, uh, a piece in our notebooks that said something along the lines of, ah, here we go. Uh, I will actually pull out the original. But I was going through our archives from, I have to look at the date, but I believe it was 1957 or something like that, a very long time ago. And I found the following uh, entry. It's not behind that. It should be RE, RE, Specimens MX 530 ABCD. This is written, handwritten in blue ink in in, in a 60-year-old notebook. These are four of a collection of 196, I believe it says, rune stones alleged alleged to have been found by William W.M., so it doesn't say William, but like that sort of abbreviation, Niven, and then an amateur archaeologist of Mexico City in the area of Atzcalpo, Salco, claiming them to be the earliest form of glyphs, which is written in longhand, which is interesting, referred to, quote, Lost Continent of Mew, end quote, by James Churchward, published by, and then it gives publishers 1931, therein, Reference to the glyphs connecting them with tablets found in a Indian monastery and confirming the author's theory with reference to the, quote, lost continent of Mew, end quote. And when that happened, uh, <laughs> within the last year, I pretty much had the eyes bug out of my head on a Saturday evening And I ran at absolute top speed down to my basement to find these things. So you had, Jeb, you had no, there was no 
you had no idea that this stuff was hanging out in the basement of your institution. Well, it's funny because I had actually seen them. And I'm like, what in the hell are those? And oh. they're these they're these weird little they're these weird little like uh, about um about the size of your hand in a fist stones. And Ken, you actually know about what these look like. Right. Well, how do you know? You sent me three D scans of these things. I sent you a, oh, I sent cool. you a printed one. So the very first thing I did. Now I have not actually seen the full examples of all of the the classic films of Abbott and Costello versus the Mummy, or Abbott and Costello versus Wolfman. But right. I do know in these films that whenever they would find a dead body or a coffin, they would turn their back and it would disappear. But, but Abbott, it was just there. <laughs> of course, yes. So I assumed that if I put these things out of my sight, you get the picture. Yeah, absolutely. So right. The very first thing I did was I ran down to uh, my laboratory and spent the rest of Saturday evening because that is my social life, uh, mm -hmm. and laser scanned these with our Next Engine 3D scanner. And I actually just got some more prints uh, printed out about these recently. But um, I was like, these are things that are being documented. So I took photos, I took scans, like these are now existing because what I did know is that I had read about these 20 plus years ago. Uh, in various literature on sort of pseudo-archaeology and, and fantastic archaeology and prehistory and all of that. And I knew that they were tied to the idea of an ancient lost continent, sort of like an Atlantis, but even more uh, problematic in the Pacific called Mu. Mm -hmm. We can come back to that. Um, and that there had been over 2,600 of them in the 1920s. And then they had all disappeared. Mm -hmm. hmm. And... So there were 2,600 stones. Apparently. And the pictures, if you go look these up online, you can find pictures of William Niven's store slash museum where there are clearly hundreds of them. Wow. So there clearly were hundreds. And the 2,600, I don't know if that's an Atari shout-out or anything, but there were quite a few of them. <laughs> uh, or, 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 or an early uh, 1990s hacker board. Take your pick. But, <laughs> um, but anywho, I'm very old. But anywho um, – <laughs> I have four, I have four of them. They're actually right now, well, spoiler, in our microscopy lab, and we'll come back to that. But uh, I had four. Now, unfortunately for me and my ego, I then went and did some due diligence for about a month and determined that there are a few others hanging around. Harvard has six. And I'm like, well, <laughs> mother. And so. Well, that, that's Harvard, though. Yeah, I know, but. <laughs> And there's also apparently a few – there's one other I know of, and I, and I need to confirm it, but I, there's, there's one somewhere in the southern United States, and I know where that is. Um, but I have four of them. And so that's pretty damn awesome. Mm -hmm. So, Jeb, who's William Niven? How, how does he factor into all of this? What's, now what's the, he doing with 2,600 stones now, with glyphs on them? The very first thing I do want to point out is that anything I give you about – I take it back – Almost anything I give you uh, about William Niven is actually coming from a biographical work uh, written by um, actually the uh, director of our art museum here at uh, Miami University in Ohio, Robert Wicks. And he is co-authoring with – and I don't know why my book is not here, but I'll just Google it up so that's not a problem. Oh, there it is. There it is. Um, Buried Cities – Forgotten Gods, William Niven's Life of Discovery and Revolution in Mexico and the American Southwest by Robert S. Wicks and Roland H. Harrison, published by uh, Texas Tech University Press in 1999. And it is a solid biography. And so almost all the biography I'm giving you on Niven, now the other stuff comes from various other sources, um, comes from there. So anything I say about him, uh, talk to Dr. Wicks and we are going to talk. He knows about these. Um, they were sort of hidden in our, in our basement as things happen. Uh, but uh, I have now shown them to him. I brought him over to the museum, and we've talked about them. Uh, but he went and did the background research on all of this. And Robert Roland, excuse me, Roland H. Harrison is actually, I believe, the grandson of William Niven. Now, William Niven was a Scottish American geologist. He started as a geologist. He was Scottish, came to America, immigrated to the United States. Yeah, excuse me. And um, 
went to uh, the greater Southwest and the West and started doing geological prospecting and started to really get a lot of sort of fame, not fame, but success in, in doing all of this work. And so, for example, when he goes out there, uh, he, uh, he finds a number of minerals and other stuff, and he actually gets really kind of in with people when he finds an incredibly large garnet stone in a New York construction project. Like they're digging in Manhattan or New, maybe not Manhattan, New York, finds a massive garnet stone, and it gets in the American Museum of Natural History, which creates a relationship with them. So he has a relationship with the Peabody with the American Museum of Natural History and other museums. He ends up being one of the founders of the Houston Museum of Science. Okay. Okay. So he's got all of this history there. But he goes to Mexico and starts doing prospecting of all sorts. He gets really interested in West West Mexico, in Guerrero, and other states in archaeology as well. And, for example, he excavates in West Mexico and gives – a number of artifacts to the uh, American Museum of Natural History in New York, which becomes the Jessup Collection of Mexican Antiquities, named after Morris K. Jessup, the president of the museum. And again, I'm getting this from both Niven and from Wix and Harrison. Uh, So he ends up, by the late teens, early 20s, having the largest, quote-unquote, private museum in Mexico City, in which you can also purchase things. Sure. So it's as much a gallery as it is a museum. Well, in a store, yeah. So yeah. he's got like fifteen to 20,000 pieces supposedly in a gallery museum store in Mexico City. And uh, quite a number of things are sold from, but from his store to other locations. Uh, and this is in the wild and woolly days of all of this, although it's beginning sure. to come to an end. And that's actually uh, what happens is he starts to get increasingly into conflict with Manuel Gamio. Manuel Gamio is considered one of the big founders of Mexican archaeology as it begun, begins to professionalize. And he's a student of Franz Boas. He is doing stratigraphy at the same time that A.V. Kidder is doing stratigraphy in the American Southwest and should be thought of in very much the same, uh, the same kind of breath as A.V. Kidder and Max Ule and Nels Nelson as one sure. of the pioneers of Americanist archaeology. And he's at the head of the growing Department of Archaeology, and he's not a huge fan of Ivan. And there's actually like legal sparring and he like at one point alludes to charlatans in the press uh, and he mentions that Niven's got a skull which he shouldn't have in his like window store and Niven gets all huffy and goes in and complains and there's this back and forth including about Niven's belief and discussion of super ancient civilizations in the new world versus relatively recent people coming from Siberia. And it's not long after that that these stones begin to appear in Atzcapotzalco, a suburb of Mexico City. Okay. Now, um, others who have studied Wix's notes and have looked at him, including, or not Wix's notes, uh, Niven's notes, including Bob Wix, uh, and the people at the time very much believed that Niven was above board, that he was possibly... There's a common thing that you find occasionally when you have people who seed stuff into your work. They're like for a joke or for other reasons, uh, pass fakes along. And um, you guys have covered uh, – what was it? The genetic stone? What was that? Uh, the disc. Yeah, the genetic yeah. disc. Genetic disc. Disc, yeah. Um, but you have not covered the Ica stones? We have not talked about the Ica stones yet. Or the Acombro oh. figurines. No. Uh, no, okay. neither of those. Those are both cases in – both in Latin America, but you can find them elsewhere. I mean I can think of – now, I don't want to get into glossal fighting and all of that, but there's other cases where you have people that are seeding archaeological sites. The most famous is Piltdown. Right. You know, most people now believe that Dawson – although, again, there's a lot of speculation – that Dawson was the faker on Piltdown and that he sort of hoaxed people by burying stuff. Sure. So a lot of people, when Niven's like, I found these stones – this massive glyph library. Um, a lot of his peers initially were like, oh my God, you have found like pre-Maya hieroglyphs. This is amazing. Please send us samples. And he was more than happy to send these samples to the American Museum of Natural History and the blah, 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 until they saw them. Right. And they are these really fragile looking volcanic tuff. It's called talpatate, this really soft tuff that when you expose it to air, solidifies. It's still really fragile. And here's the kicker. If you look at a picture of these, 
the designs that are kind of like excised into them or out of them, yeah, they follow the contours of the stones. Sure. Every single one I have seen. So they're not like broken pieces. No. And if these were diamond, if they were Moe's Hardness 10, that might make some sense. I'm pretty sure I could crush these with my hands. Sure, right? Of course. If I was part of the great conspiracy to not allow uh, the Illuminati knowledge of the continent of Mew to get out, I'm sure I could have destroyed them by now. Um, But they're really fragile, so they should be broken. And every single picture you look up online or in books or anything, they directly follow the contour of the stones. That just is crazy. Right. And so every single person who looked at them in the 1920s were like, these are... uh, Oh, I, uh, uh, Mr. Niven, we believe your workers are having one over on you. <laughs> and, and so that was where it lay until they got taken up. And again, we can kind of go back to the lineage of this by Colonel James Churchward, who became convinced that they were part of the lost continent of Mew. Which uh, I don't know if you want to go back and tell the story of Mew or kind of finish sort of the Niven story or which way you want to go with that. Well, I, the question I have for you, Jeb, is that yes. is anybody looking at these glyphs and saying, oh, these these specific glyphic forms are reminiscent of specific glyphs seen on monuments in Mesoamerica, Mayan monuments? No, not a single so, person. So there's so there's no they, these are completely new forms and there's no apparent morphological connection to anything that's seen in Mesoamerica. No, and they're filled in with paint, which is weird, and they're incredibly fragile. And so when people visited his excavations, now, when I say his excavations, to put this into context, um, he had people that he hired that lived on the land, that he was hiring their land from them, so you deal with that, what you want to do with that. Um, He was on his store six days a week. Sundays were his like pleasure day, as 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 Wicks and Harrison talk about when he would go out and see the excavations, which means that he wasn't on site six days out of seven. Right. So when people visited, like archaeologists like Sylvanus Morley, who was an incredibly important early Maya archaeologist, an expert in Maya hieroglyphs, also a spy, <laughs> who who got who got Franz Boas kicked out of the AAA. Or uh, Thomas Gann, who was a partner in crime with F.A. Mitchell Hedges of Crystal Skull fame. Or, Fran, or, or, or uh, Franz Blom, who was uh, uh, the head of the Middle American Research Institute. They all looked at these glyphs and were like, these are complete BS. But they saw them coming out of the ground. So I will give that. They were, they were indeed coming out of the ground, So, but whether they were being put in on six days that were not Sunday, I don't know. But they saw these things. And again, Sylvanus Morley, as much as I have some issues with Sylvanus Morley on his glyphs because, you know, he was working in the 20s, he didn't know everything, blah, blah, blah. He would have been one of the world experts on my hieroglyphs and on anything related to them. And he never wrote about them. He saw them. He wrote about them in letters. He never did anything with them. So no, there's no nobody's looking at him as being looking like anything like Mesoamerica whatsoever. So nobody thought they were authentic originally. Not at the time, except for so when that happened and all the museums started to send them back to him, this churchward guy who has theosophical leanings and interests, which we can get into, um, he's like, Oh, I know what they are. They look just like the Nakal tablets from India that I have inspected. <laughs> so so before we get any deeper into this hey Ken can you give us a description can you give us a, a a brief history on Mew I don't I can give I can talk about Atlantis but Mew is going to be that we need we need Jeb to tell us about Mew oh okay for yeah sure. go okay um so so Atlantis I mean you know you guys did your whole episode on Atlantis what's the origin of Atlantis so, right, uh, so that would, we're talking about yeah, obviously yeah. that's Plato in uh-huh. um, two of his dialogues. He, he invents this story of this uh, perfect society, which is ancient Athens, and Atlantis is the uh, the plot device, the evil empire that is going to show how Athens 
uh, reacts in uh, to this this existential threat right. in this way that reflects the perfection of their their political society. So yours is an ancient text that people. I mean, nobody nobody denies there's, there's at least some discussion of Atlantis in the classical world. It gets resurrected in the colonial era, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mu dates back to. Uh, an individual named uh, Brass, well, he's got a bunch of titles, but Brassor de Bourbourg is how he's best known. He is a very important individual in the beginning of Maya studies. Uh, if you've ever heard of the Popol Vuh, the Popol Vuh is one of the longest, I think it's the longest, indigenous language colonial era text in the New World. It is in Quiche Maya. It's often been called the Bible of the Quiche Maya. It is our best text on sort of pre-contact, although it's not pre-contact, but what you can glean out of it, pre-contact ideas about religion, creation, all these things in the Maya and Mesoamerican world. It was written around 1605 by a number of Quiche scholars in Spanish characters, but in ancient Quiche. He finds, he's not the only person who finds a copy, but he finds a copy of it in archives. He finds fragments of one of the three or four, and I don't want to get into that controversy, pre-contact Maya books, the codices, parts of what eventually is called the Madrid Codex because fragments are found in Madrid. Okay. But he, probably the most important thing he finds is the Relacion de las Cosas de Yucatan by the Archbishop of Yucatan in the late in the 16th century, uh, Diego de Landa. And he writes what becomes, in essence, the Rosetta Stone of Maya hieroglyphs that allows a later translation. The problem is, even though Brassor finds that Rosetta Stone, it took people a century until they got it right. And Brassor and his fascination with Atlantis and Mew is actually part of why people didn't get it right. But um, the Relacion de las Cosas de, de Yucatan, um, basically, it was really easy to get sued in Spanish colonial times. Uh, it was assumed that you were likely to possibly be corrupt or do other bad things. And so there would be a legal examination. These are the people at the Inquisition, after all. There would be a legal examination of what you are doing after you held an office. And so Londa was examined. So Relacion de las Cosas de Yucatan was his legal defense. And in it, he told about all the things he did, including burning Maya books and burning Maya, quote unquote, idols, ritual objects and so forth, and destroying Maya culture as best he could. That was his job. However, he also recorded many things about the calendar and numbers and all this sort of stuff. But probably the most important thing he recorded was what he called an alphabet. And this alphabet became what eventually allows us to read Maya hieroglyphs. And he would ask people, oh, deme la letra por A, o B, o C. Give me the letter for A or B or C. But of course, Maya hieroglyphs don't work in letters. They work in syllables and ideograms, and it gets complicated with morphosyllabism and all of that. But um, he didn't understand what he was looking at. He had, was in essence, a syllabary of a symbol meaning the sound be or bo or boo rather than just the sound B, bu. Right. And so he wrote that down. And this was eventually discovered in the 19 – that it was understood in the 1950s by Russian scholar Yuri Norosov, and that led to the phonetic aspect of Maya decipherment. But this was found by Brassor de Borborg in the 19th century. The problem was is that Borborg was – or Brassor was politely crazy – crazy-ass eccentric. Okay. Uh, he was convinced that there were secret meanings behind all the hieroglyphs that were all about the fiery destruction of Atlantis. Okay. Yeah. So every single one had a sound, but it also was a thing. And he was reading this all wrong. He was assuming that these letras were actually alphabetical. And this can be a whole other discussion. Uh, it could be a whole hour on that. But he was basically completely misreading the Madrid Code. He started actually reading it backwards, not that it really would have mattered. Um, but he started creating this whole prehistory of, of it, all these things. And one of the words that he quote unquote deciphers is mu, M-U. And he thinks that refers to Atlantis, the sunken continent that is destroyed. And he, okay. he publishes all of this stuff. And at that point, that gets into the literature when it gets picked up by other people. Now, one of the people who notices it is our friend Ignatius Donnelly, 
and you guys have talked at length about Ignatius Donnelly, the sort of popularizer in the 19th century of the idea of Atlantis as this hyperdiffusionary empire that basically explains world prehistory without actually explaining world prehistory. Right. Okay, so let's take a break right here. Okay. And when we come back, we'll continue the story and tie we'll talk about, Mew back to your stuff. We'll talk, about the, we'll talk about the La Plagence. There we go. Hello, everyone. Chris Webster here from the Archaeology Podcast Network, and we're giving away an iPad Mini 4 to one of our listeners. The iPad Mini 4 came out in September. It's a 16 gigabyte space gray iPad with AT&T cellular ready antenna. All that means is it comes with a GPS. You do not need to get a data plan. And you don't even need to be on AT&T if you never get a plan to get a data plan. It just has GPS. It also has a fingerprint sensor and Apple Pay ready and all the good perks that come with that. So it's a good iPad. We use them in the field. There are two easy ways to enter. One, do a Profiles and CRM interview before December 15th, 2015, or recommend someone for an interview. You'll both get an entry once the interview is posted. If you want to know more about Profiles and CRM, go to www.archaeologypodcastnetwork.com forward slash profiles. All the questions are listed right there. The other way to enter is to like the APN Facebook page and share it with your friends on Facebook to get the word out about our awesome podcasts. The winner will be announced December 16th, 2015 at 4 p.m. Pacific time. So get your entries in, send me those emails for people that want to do the Profiles in Syrian podcast, and good luck to everyone. Hi, Mac. Take us out with a binary solo. And we're back, and we're back with Jeb Carb, and can you... Uh, can you pick up where you left? Sure. I, I've got a question for you first, Jeff. Yes, so absolutely. So is Prasura saying that the Maya are a colony of Atlanteans or they were insp- their culture was inspired by Atlantis? He was um, a bit scattery. So, yes. <laughs> yes to both of those. <laughs> yeah, yes to everything, actually, with him. He oh, also right. wrote, I think, like 14 novels or something like that. So take that as you will. Mm-hmm. Very prolific. So the next per- the next people that kept to pick up on this are Augustus and Alice Le Plongeon. And there's also plenty of books on them, including from New Mexico Press. Uh, and it's Diamond is one of them. And I'd have to look up the citation. I can actually probably find it while I'm looking. Um, but there's tons of stuff on them. Desmond and Messenger, not Diamond. Desmond and Messenger, 1988, and other sources by them. Desmond and Messenger, 1989. And these two are fascinating. They're some of the first archaeologists to dig in Yucatan. And by the way, this is when Yucatan like still has the Kruzob, like these like Maya independence guys who are heavily armed and like sniping at like Mexican soldiers, like in their territory. So I mean they're like roughing it, to say the least. And they go and they dig Chichen Itza. If you've ever heard of a chakmul, one yes. of those reclining figures, they Ooh. found the first one and named it. Oh my God. Okay. The problem is, is that they also believed that like Certain things in the bas reliefs at Chichen were actually evidence of telegraph lines, or that they were both reincarnated Maya, Atlantean, Egyptian royalty, uh, including the fact that. Well, if you're going to be reincarnated, you may as well be royalty. Exactly. And so they believed that uh, Augustus was Prince Ko, the beloved of Queen, and here it comes, uh, wait. Mu, Queen Mu. And so they take the name Mu from Brasur, who reads it incorrectly from his half-assed reading of the Madrid Codex, misinterpreting Delanda's uh, actual alphabet from the 16th century. And so they come up with this whole story of Atlantis and the Maya region. And then when everything goes to hell, uh, Mu actually goes to Egypt becomes Isis, yes, not like Isis, the people that are destroying Palmyra right now, but Isis, the ancient Egyptian goddess of magic, who's kind of cool, and build <laughs> and builds the Sphinx because you know if you have magic, um, right? And involves Atlantis and all of this, and they believe that they were reincarnations. And at one point, La Plongeon, Augustus La Plongeon says that he stands in front of a a bas relief of a Maya lord. And, like, the beard shows that he's a reincarnation and all these other things. Um, So they write about all of this. And they're good friends with Helena Petrovna 
Blavatsky. There you go. The head of theosophy <clears throat> and the author of The Secret Doctrine, which is pretty much one of the or texts of everything wooish and occult underworld and Atlantis and sunken continents and everything that becomes ancient aliens and so forth and so on. And I'd love to talk about that some more as well. You've had Colavito on, but I'd love to talk about some more. But <laughs> that gets incorporated in Donnelly. That gets incorporated in Blavatsky. So that's where Mew starts to go forward until it gets even crazier. In 1912... Paul Schliemann gives an interview with the New York American. Now, if I say Schliemann, what does that bring to mind? That guy I don't like. <laughs> What's that? That's that's obviously that's so Schliemann is in, in many people's minds he's like the first archaeologist uh, and but not Paul, but not Paul Schliemann, not Paul Schliemann. Oh, of course. Who's who's the one, who's the one you're talking about? Heinrich Schliemann. Heinrich Schliemann, yes. He goes and he finds Troy. At, he's Sarlik in Anatolia in Turkey. Okay, right. great. He finds ancient legend. He finds the Trojan War, blah, 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 blah. And you, no, he doesn't. I, no, no, he doesn't. Exactly. He digs a goddamn hole straight through it. No. You, exactly. You guys have talked about him before. He basically uses dynamite to go through it, uh, and he ruins everything. But exactly. But he finds, and I'm like super air quoting here, he finds myth. <laughs> Right. So he's right, like right. crazy famous at this time. Um, he supposedly has a grandson by the name of Paul, which he doesn't really. Okay. Now, I did find a New York Times article that talks about Schliemann. Now, I need to look into Schliemann's biography a little more. I do know that his actual son was Agamemnon, which if you're going to be Heinrich Schliemann, that's exactly <laughs> what you're going to do. Well, of course. Him. Yes. Um, was a diplomat. He was Greek. Because he marries in Greece and he has Greek kids and blah, blah. He's German. He's not American. But his son Agamemnon was a diplomat to the United States. There's nothing about Paul Schliemann or Atlantis. But in the uh, Randolph Hearst-owned New York American. Now, do we need to explain who Randolph Hearst was? I think so, probably. Go, well, go say, watch probably. Citizen Kane. <laughs> And yes. you'll see who, who, who Hearst was. was yeah. Is, uh, is he a be. trustworthy figure? He is kind of the the original, well, or the most famous of the the non journalist journalists. So he'll put the anything in journalists. his papers, anything in his papers that's going to sell papers. Exactly, yellow journalists. He is routinely considered one of the forces that created the uh, Spanish American War, which again is in is in Citizen Kane. Uh, and yeah, he is the model for Citizen Kane, which is why he you know basically tried to get Orson Welles blackballed and any right. number of things. Look up what Rosebud actually means. Um, which is I can't talk about on your podcast, but um, so anywho, uh, the New York American article is entitled by Paul Schliemann, "How I Found the Lost Atlantis, the Source of All Civilization." Now this is in 1912, and it talks about a ton about Heinrich Schliemann and all this other stuff. I suspect basically somebody dug out of what's called the morgue, the old archives of the newspaper. Something on Heinrich Schliemann, I was like, hey, you know what? Let's write a story about this dude. Now, the article talks about an, an expedition to the Bay of Campeche in search of sunken cities and all this other stuff because supposedly Heinrich Schliemann, the guy who finds Troy, left a secret envelope, a sealed envelope that was going to be opened upon his death about his quest for Atlantis. Now, Schliemann talked a lot of shit. <laughs> he never but, said anything about Atlantis. No. The letter tells his grandson to open, to break open an owl-headed vase in which he finds documents about Atlantis, weird old coins, artifacts from Tiwanaku, a Maya document about doomed love in Atlantis, and so on. And it goes on and on and on, including discussing the land of Mew which is supposedly in a Lhasa text, a Chaldean document in a Tibetan <laughs> monastery. Now, Chaldean means ancient Iraq. So it's supposedly a Chaldean document in a Tibetan monastery. Now, here's the thing. This story is pretty much a retelling of the best-selling novel, She, 
by H. Ryder Haggard, the guy who basically invents uh, Alan Quatermain and Indiana Jones and mm-hmm. every adventure story you've ever read. And we talked a little about this last time at the Victorian stuff. He invents the adventure romance in which an aged professor leaves notes to find in an ancient box all these records. This, it sounds like she. It's basically plagiarizing she. And so I'm pretty sure that's what's happening. But whoever wrote this thing, I'm pretty sure their name wasn't Paul or Schliemann, uh, uses Mew because it's in Blavatsky or Le Plongeon or Donnelly or whatever they're ripping off. And at that point, Mew becomes an ancient land written about in an ancient Tibetan monastery text. And that gets us almost to Niven because the thing, remember I said there was this one guy who would listen to William Niven and that was Colonel James Churchward who said he knocked around India and saw ancient documents in the Nakal language that talked about the lost continent of Mu. And <laughs> Jeff, how does yeah. it how does it go from the Atlantic Ocean, it's Atlantis, to a continent in the Pacific? Well, now Mu kind of sounds like another continent. So what are the there's there's Atlantis? What's the other one? Lemuria. Lemuria. Now, do you guys want to tell sort of the origins of Lemuria, like where that name comes from? It's kind of in the name. Well, because of the lemurs on Madagascar, and there's this 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 uh, um, assertion that if you look at the uh, botanical and faunal um, assemblages in what is it in in um, in Africa and Madagascar, and if you look on the other side of and the Indonesia, Pacific, in Indonesia there there are these connections, and so yeah. how could we have similar species? Right across these vast stretches of ocean, maybe there, maybe what we're seeing now are remnants of what was one enormous body of land, a, co- a Ex- lost continent. Exactly. If you do not have continental drift, how on earth do you get lemurs all around the Indian Ocean? Right. Conclusion: The Indian Ocean was clearly a place that was once a sunken continent. Let's call it Lemuria because that's fun. And so. Um, Mew sounds a lot like Lemuria. Now, Lemuria is in Helena Petrovna Blavatsky's uh, Isis Unveiled. It was, it's, it's in The Secret Doctrine. The Isis Unveiled is more Egypt-focused. But it's this ancient Lemuria as where the ancient prehistory of humans and root races and Venusian se- ascended masters and the Book of Zion and all this other kind of like proto-Lovecraft bullshit comes from. And it's really it's, crazy, crazy shit. Oh, yeah. I mean, well, church words, church words is even worse. It's all crazy racist and colonialist and, like, the white people are on top and blah, 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 blah. And so he makes his own version. He puts it farther in the Pacific, which basically means it actually is real yech from Lovecraft. Now, I'm not saying Lovecraft got it from there, but it's the same damn thing. Um, so uh, Churchwood reads about these because Niven is profiled in the Dearborn Independent – which is Henry Ford's personal newspaper out of Dearborn, Michigan, which closes a few later, a few years later, because even from the 1920s, it was crazy racist and anti-Semitic. If, like, you're that anti-Semitic in the 1920s, that's pretty bad. So that's where Churchward sees these things, and he incorporates them in his book called The Lost Continent of Mew without telling Niven. But then he gets in touch with Niven, and they start to communicate back and forth. And much of Wix's and Harrison's book is kind of trying to sort of say, look, these things did exist, or these other things, not saying they're real, but like, look, this guy is not just what James Churchward wrote about. And that's true. I don't want to not say that. But there's a reason the two kind of go together, because they did start collaborating. Eventually, they had a falling out. But basically, I think Churchwood was like, well, the Atlantic is taken. The Indian Ocean is taken. There's nothing in the Pacific. There's Easter Island. F it. Let's put it there. Um, Now, that said, I actually have looked through archaeological texts of the time, like sort of the equivalent of like common textbooks of today of the time from the 1920s. And they did not believe in the idea of a sunken continent in the Pacific or transoceanic. But clearly people did because I went to Stonehenge earlier this year and in Stonehenge, when you get like all the audio stuff, they're like, by the way, Stonehenge is totally not built by Druids. Did we mention it's not built by Druids? It's not built by Druids. Druids did not build Stonehenge. And so clearly people believe Druids built Stonehenge. Right. These books are written in the same way. They're sort of like totally not across the Pacific, across the Pacific. No, nope, 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 nope. 
because people clearly kind of thought that. And that was a very common idea at the time, the idea that like, oh, they're building weird stuff in the jungle in the Khmer region. That's clearly the Maya stuff. Now, we now know that's all crap. But um, at the time, it was a pretty common idea. And sure. so the idea that there might have been a sunken continent that maybe facilitated this was actually not as strange, especially in the era of before continental drift, as it is today. That said, he was still kind of off Churchwood. Again, like there was all these crazy notions and racial castes and all of this. And he said he, had, he said the glyphs on the stones in Mexico were the same glyphs that he had seen as a privileged person who was shown them by special monks and priests in India on special tablets. So that's that's pretty much the connection. In that. <laughs> I, if I if I thrown too much at you, if you're like, dear God, he was crazy last time. Why did we bring it back? <laughs> no. So. Now let's go back. Let's go back to Niven again. Sure. So now is 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 do do you believe that Niven is the guy who is actually creating these stones, or is he uh, the victim of somebody else creating these stones and he's and feeding them to him? Now first off, really believe this stuff. Now first off, now I don't. I I am not saying at all that Niven believed in Mew. I don't believe that he worked with Churchwood. I think right. he was kind of happy to get like somebody who believed him. Uh, okay. They did not say they were fakes. Um, Niven had already admitted at one point he had he had given a paper that was all about this like um, so Gamio, the head of national archaeology in Mexico, right. was breaking ground with stratigraphy and showing the sequence that becomes the backbone of later archaeology in Mexico. Niven was kind of doing the same thing, but his ideas were much older. Not his ideas were older, but he's like, oh. Things that are archaic are 10,000 years old. We now know these things are basically late pre-classic, about 2,300 years old. Right. And his stuff that he thought was thousands of years old is from the city of Teotihuacan, which is about 14 to 1,600 years ago. Um, and so Niven was off on his time, but he was sort of doing the same thing, but not really. And some of the artifacts that were actually helping him were, in fact, fake. And when this was pointed out to him, he admitted it, and he's like, I will remove these. Mm -hmm. So that had already happened to him. He had already had people seed stuff into his digs on him or into, into his hands on him. So he was open to the idea. Now, the fact that he had gotten into an argument specifically with Gamio about um, – he had gotten into an argument specifically with Gamio about the idea of a super ancient civilization in the Americas. So finding an ancient glyph library that's over 10,000 years old is exactly what he was looking for. Mm -hmm. Sure. Just like Piltdown, where Piltdown was exactly what Charles Dawson's friends were looking for evolutionarily. Right. But, he fulfilled an expectation. Absolutely. Precisely. But at the same time, the people that have read Niven's notes, which I have not, I've worked on their secondary sources, they think that he believed that he was – he finding real things. Not that he was finding Mew, but he they don't think that he was bullshitting. So, okay. and I, I, I'm skeptical of that. So one of the things we're actually doing, I mentioned that these are not in my office. I'm actually collaborating with our microscopy lab right now. And I want to know what the pigments are made out of. Because there's pigments on these. Sure. I think that if these pigments are sort of May if they have lead in them, that scream or other kinds of indu like if they were bought in a store in the 1920s in Mexico, mm -hmm. that to me suggests that Niven may have been involved. Because if you are somebody who's kind of a subsistence farmer and you're making money off this guy and you're faking them on your own recognizance, you're not going to spend a lot of money doing it. So you might find local pigments. But if you're doing it because somebody's asking you to, you're like, by the way, Mr. Niven, can you please give us some um, money to buy paint? Or will you buy the paint? And so if it comes out that they're industrial, that would suspect to me. I mean, I don't think they're real either way. Again, if you look at them, they're not. But right. I would like to, I think looking at how they're made, but especially what the pigments are, might give us an idea of whether Niven's hand was in it. It will not prove it. It's just like additional data to sort of consider when we try to understand them. Right. So I actually have them in the microscopy lab, and um, 
I don't have the results yet. They haven't done the analysis, but I'm hoping in the next week or so we will actually have some answers that I might go, oh, I have no idea what I'm looking at right now. I don't know how this is going to come out. Right. But it's interesting that you're having the analysis done. Oh, yeah. Because it's this is going to be a fun reveal one way or the other. Yeah. Because we are taking objects that are controversial for one reason or another. Yeah. We're submitting them to actual scientific testing, uh, looking at them archaeologically, and we will have an answer. Uh, and hopefully it will help, you know, kind of illuminate more information about these actual stones. Well, I think there's a fantastic story here. I mean, the story of the professionalization and nationalization, which is a whole other interesting thing. So, for example, Niven was really friendly with the National Museum in Mexico, which was kind of in a spat with Gamio and his Office of Archaeology, his Dirección de Arqueología. And so you're seeing the sort of the birth pangs of professional Mexican archaeology sort of refracted through this and North American archaeology professionalizing at the same time and all these things going on and seeing how archaeology is changing and how the role of museums is changing and all these things going on. And there's a whole, whole story here. Now, the thing I'm scared of is I'm going to somehow screw this all up and people are like, oh, you proved they're real. I'm like, no, they're not real. But, uh, and nothing, I mean, the thing is, you could make these with a rock and use local pigments in 1922. This is not like the crystal skull where, like, oh, they were polished over 600 years. No, 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 no. This is soft volcanic pumice. These would be just as makeable in 1921 as they are in 921. I mean, or in 10,000 and 921 right. BC. I mean, that that's not the issue. The issue is more, I'm fully believing that these are from the 20th century. The question is, what can I learn about them that then will tell us more about what was going on and the relationship between popular belief and fiction and science and the growth of archaeology as a discipline? But yeah, I'd rather know than rather just pontificate based on what I'm bringing to them. And if that gets a little like vague and uncomfortable, well, welcome to science. Exactly. So, Jeb, if, if have you had a chance to look at the fringe literature now about these stones? Are there people out there right now with websites saying this is something that that Mesoamericanists have been trying to hide for years, but there are these twenty six hundred stones that show a completely different um, culture history for Mesoamerica. Well, there's actually two two funny things you bring that up. Now, one, I'll come back to the to your actual question, but before I forget, sure. I mentioned Brasser de Borborg. Right. He he may be the first person that alleged that museums were hiding the truth about archaeology. In the 1860s, he alleged that the Louvre was not willing to admit that the gold work of the Americas was the greatest gold work in history. Did he publish that? He talked about it. Right. He talked about it, yeah. I can't remember if it was letters or publications, but he okay. made it known that he believed that they were conspiring. He was a he was like well respected because he did find real things and he was of right. course you no know, an abbey. So rather than being called bug shit insane, he was considered eccentric. <laughs> Uh, but yes, he may actually be the patient zero for the idea that museums are hiding the truth. Mm -hmm. um, but to answer your question, I've been sort of bagging a little on Colonel James Churchward. His grandson actually has a website called mymew.com or something like that. That <laughs> is actually about this. And he, I actually have bought a copy of him republishing part of his grandfather's uh, publications. Uh, so I, once he finds this out, I am sure that I'm going to have a time. Well, I just typed in mymew.com and it's a shoe sales place. Okay. <laughs> if on. you need some lovely no, corkwood I don't, flats. I don't want to, that's not it. That's not it. I want to, I, I don't want to <laughs> like, I don't want to give anybody bad, you know, uh, my mew church word, um, m y dash m u dot com. Oh, and there should be a picture of a, a guy looking. He, he kind of looks like the dude from the Big Lebowski a little. He's got a beard 
Yep. And MyMu.com, the source for your information on the lost continent of Mu and ancient advanced civilizations. And he actually has some really good images, and he actually references uh, Wicks and Harrison as having some of the best pictures. He's got resources and all this. And I'm not going to pick a fight, but he's got podcasts from 2014, examining the Mound Builders calendar stone, um, subscribe to the newsletter and receive a free PDF copy of the Index to James Churchward's 1926 book, Lost Continent of Mew, Motherland of Man. And Churchward Wurtz wrote several books, uh, Lost Continent of Mew, Children of Mew, right. Sacred Symbols of Mew. Um, I think there may be a few others I'm forgetting, but those are the big three. But so you see those. It's, it's one that's not, I mean, it's not got the name brand of Eric Von Daniken. But it's in the same stew, right? Of course, and it will and it will kind of show up, and you'll see it mentioned. It's not mentioned as much, and that actually is one of the things. So I'm going to be presenting this at the American Anthropological Association meetings in Denver. Um, I think on like November 21st or the 20th in Denver, Colorado, which I've probably now done something terrible. But um, <laughs> and one of the things in my paper is one of the last questions in my abstract is. I, I was kind of playing off the riff of horror movies, which Ken started with. Is this something I should have left alone? Well, hold that thought. Yeah, and that's a legitimate question. Should I have left we're gonna, alone? We're going to go to break real quick yes. and uh, let you torture yourself with that. Okay. And when we come back, we will discuss if you did or okay. not. Okay. <laughs> The Archaeology and AL podcast presents a monthly series of lectures on all aspects of archaeology. These lectures are part of the Archaeology in the City program, hosted by the University of Sheffield in England, and are held at the Red Deer Pub near the end of the month. The podcast can be heard a few days later. Check out the Red Deer if you're in the area, or find this podcast on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, and at www.archaeologypodcastnetwork.com. Now let's get back to the show. So we are back and we are wrapping up our discussion with Jeff Carb about the Muse Stones. Um, so any finishing thoughts before we uh, before we await your results? Well, you guys are asking fantastic questions, so uh, I think that might well, help. Ken, Ken is asking fantastic well, questions. This isn't so much a question as as a, an observation. Sure. Uh, one of the things that you very often hear from the fringe crowd, and this this. I don't know that they said this about the Muse Stones. There are 2,600 of them. You'll hear this. You'll hear this about the the Burroughs Cave artifacts, the Michigan relics, and the Ica Stones. That which is there are so many of them. Why would a faker? How could a faker produce this huge body of work? And so it's the the mere number is used as evidence of authenticity. And I would fully expect if 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 more of the fringe people know about this and talk about it, that 2,600 number is going to show up again and again and yeah. again as, a, as, a, a, as evidence for authenticity. Well, the thing I would say is that he was finding these over a couple of years, and if you're frankly a farmer or a farmer's family in the off-season, off you have a lot of time. Right. And these were not intricate objects. If you go – I mean I can, I, I can provide images of my four, but if you just go Google images of these – they're not intricate objects. Um, some of them are kind of interesting looking. Some look like your five-year-old's like crayon thing that you put on the refrigerator. And uh, they were carved in a soft stone. And the thing I would point to, now you guys need to do shows on these, and I'm not the expert on either of these, but the Ica stones and the Acombero figurines, they were made in the same quantities. And in both cases, the people that made them have fessed up. Oh, yeah, the Ica stones. That's a great story about yeah. the Ica stones. And again, we've got the actual artist who said, yeah, I make these all the time. And, yeah. and I make and I, I use these magazine images. Um, and that's so those. But but for whatever reason, it's sometimes the sheer number of a particular um, assemblage, a fake assemblage. It's just the mere number seems to convince some people that they must be real. No, I mean, I get that logic. I understand that because think of how many times we have said an anecdote is problematic. If you have one of something, it's a problem. Right. And they're like, well, fine. Here's 2,600. <laughs> 2,600. Problem Absolutely. solved. Uh, but that, that creates its own problem, though. Well, right. Because here's course. the thing. If only one person is ever finding them. Right. Which is exactly the case here. 
Yes. Nobody has ever. Do you think the number twenty six is significant? No, I think they ran out of time. No, I mean, I really, I mean, I joked. I, I, <laughs> I don't know why, um, but nobody ever. Uh, now, here's the thing. Um, I have looked through Wix and Harrison. I have looked through Niven's is original uh, articles and stuff. I have not looked at his like original hand notes. He found a few things out in West Mexico that remind me of these. That's suspicious to me. It's one thing if the landowners that he was working with are one thing, but if they're following him. But I need to dive into the primary sources more to really talk about that, so I don't want to go. But you can tell I kind of fall onto the I do wonder if he was involved. Right. But I can't say that. So... I'm leaving that as an open question. And again, that's why I want more data. And again, right. after I get the microscopy, I'm not going to be able to say that, but it's going to be more information. Right. So, Jeb, you've got four of them. Harvard's yes. got six of them. Yes. Uh, one other place has one. Let's do the math 2,600 minus four minus six minus one. Man, there are 11 where, that are accounted for. Where the hell are the rest of them? Well, now that's really interesting. So in Buried Cities, Forgotten Gods by Robert S. Wicks and Roland H. Harrison, they document that he finds a big slab, this massive slab of a very similar style, shallow incision with pigment on it, which, again, mm -hmm. is not a thing. OK. Right. Uh, and he wants to ship it out. And church word, let me find my notes, because where they want to ship it is amazing. They want to ship it to. Uh, oh, God, what is it? What does he call it? They want to ship it to the Museum of the Little Church at Valley Forge, the Shrine of North America. That makes perfect sense, doesn't it? Doesn't it? And so, so Niven was trying to get money from the Carnegie Institute to fund it. So on the right. one hand, there's this whole argument, oh, he didn't need money, he's doing that. On the other hand, he's constantly talking about money. And so he wants to ship this thing, and he's asking for a significant amount of money, $1,000 for travel expenses and $5,000 to move the stone, which in 1927, interest calculator, <laughs> uh, let's see, um, money chimp, I'm not giving them a thing. Oh, that's, I don't want that. Um, I want to know. I it's have a to shit ton of money. It is. Yeah, it's, it is. It's a lot of money. It's a lot of money. So I'm not going to go through anyway. But it's a lot of money, and like people, that's why he didn't get the money. And and so, uh, oh, I know what I want. I know. I know. I can find this. Um, <laughs> but um, but anyway, he wants to move this thing. And at one point during the negotiations, he says something along the lines of, um, "Oh." I will give up to the because he he's at this point he's gotten a foul of the um, the got the Mexican government. And he's like I will give up all of my other stones, all the ones we're talking about, uh -huh. if I can get this one thing out. Does it sound like he really heavily valued these things? By the way, five thousand dollars in nineteen to twenty seven is sixty seven thousand four hundred thirteen dollars and six cents in twenty fourteen. There you go. That's a lot of money. So he was looking for money to move this thing, and he was willing to give up all of his supposed 10,000-plus-year-old glyph stones of an ancient library. That doesn't sound like he really valued these things. Or it sounds like he could... He could, uh, you know, crank these things out pretty quickly. Well, so, yeah, yeah, or yeah, he could just make yeah. them whenever he wanted. But which again, other people think he wasn't in on this, but that I think is what happened to the others. Okay. I think he, because he then he couldn't get the tablet out, so he buried it to hide it in I think Tampico, and then he said when he went back and found it, this thousands of year old tablet, because he buried it for a year, had crumbled into dust. Oh well, yeah, because that's how geology works. Right, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Again, very convenient that these things are either lost or destroyed when they're needed. Yeah, and so I think that's the thing. So actually in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, the, when people talked about the moose, I was like, oh, they're supposed to hoax, but since we can't find them, we'll never know. I see, and then right. when I found four in the basement, I'm like, oh, my dear God. And I, and I, <laughs> and I ran down at high speed to get them, and I was super crushed when I finally I, – I put out feelers to the Peabody, other places, and when I finally found that Harvard had six, I was like, well – there we go. That, there goes my little scoop. Uh, well, but the, the nice thing is, is if Harvard's got six of them, you guys can do a comparative. Yeah. No, you easily could. 
And that might be something down the road. And again, there's one other place that I know people that have it, and they don't they don't have theirs online. If you go to the Harvard Peabody, you can actually find two of them online. Oh, nice. Yeah, so I mean, you can go see them. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's so that's like I don't feel out of com- uncomfortable like talking out of school. I'm not talking out of school. The other place they're not <laughs> online, but I did talk to one of the curators, and I'm like, oh yes, we have this one. So, and I'm sure there's others out there. Yeah, I mean, the, the, here's the deal, Jeb. Though, I mean, if you're not there looking in the basement of some university in the you know in the heartland, maybe they're they're sitting there. And nobody knows what the hell they are, or doesn't yeah, think they're terribly important, thinking. and so they're they're ensconced in some box in the back yeah. of some some curated collection and nobody Precisely. knows it's even there well, or even better like oh we know they're fakes who cares right oh, but the nice thing the, the really fun thing about these is that they're actually old enough now that they themselves are artifacts oh yes absolutely they absolutely are. they're past the 75 year mark and here's the thing You've all had me on before and while I am not the world expert on all these sorts of things, I'm pretty deeply versed. I had seen them numerous times in in our basement. And I'm like <laughs> never put two and two together. I did, exactly. I'm like, well, they're really weird. I wonder what those are. <laughs> and I funny. and I knew about them. Like right, I had right. read about them in the early nineties in the library in the University of Pitts, uh, Pittsburgh in a book there. And I'm like, oh, I knew about these. And I knew about them in the back of my head. And that's when I read the entry. I'm like, oh my God. And as soon as I saw the entry, I'm like, I know exactly where those are. Because I knew what they I, at that point I'm like that's what those are. And I, <laughs> and I literally ran down, I literally ran downstairs at high speed and, and opened them up and I didn't quite hyperventilate, but it was close. It was <laughs> and what, is, what are the odds, Jeb, that these things would happen to be at a university in Ohio where somebody who's interested in this kind of stuff is, has, you know, a series of one year appointments and somebody on that campus wrote the biography of oh. the guy who was closely associated with these artifacts. Oh, and it gets even better. So I think I mentioned last time, I did, that I'm, I'm almost finished the manuscript. The word count is there. There's still a lot of mess to clean up. Um, for, the univer- for the University of New Mexico, I, I'm working on a book on these sorts of topics, like why is archaeology seen the way it is? It's called Spooky Archaeology. And I had already signed a contract for this before I found these. And so when I went to my editors at the at, at at one of the meetings, I brought one of the prints. I have my own print of these, and I'm like, "You're never gonna guess what I'm gonna find." And before I show this to you, these are real fakes. They are not fake fakes. Fake fakes. <laughs> these are authentic fakes. And um, on top of it, I mentioned that. Uh, Desmond and Messenger are the big biographers of that key link in Mew, the La Plan Jeans. Right. Those those books are published by New Mexico. <laughs> so you you will sometimes see people in sort of a culture in the paranormal world that talk about sort of Jungian synchronicity or synchronicity Synchron- yes. or, or John Keelian synchronicity, if you know what that is. Um, I'm not saying I believe in that. But that's only because I have at least some tenuous grasp on materialism because damn. <laughs> exactly. Because so, uh, think of everything we just said. And, of course, I've now just, like, given somebody a field day uh, of synchronicity. But, yeah. I mean, the, now maybe they're in every little university museum collection. But, no, there may be some weird luck here going on. I don't know. You know, you, you just go with it, Jeb, and you have, and that's, yeah. that's, that's fantastic. Now, now, Ken, I have a question for you. Now, sure. you are the kind of uh, – the, the sensei. You're, you, you, <laughs> the Yoda. How about the Yoda? You're, you're the Yoda of, of – well, I didn't, want to, I didn't want to insult your syntax, but you, <laughs> you are the Yoda of, of kind of, of looking at pseudo-archaeology today. And um, – I sent you a copy of one of these. Yes. Now, do you, and then we and, and and I got in trouble for mentioning curiosity cabinets and brass goggles and all other sorts of things last time. And you will get in trouble again, sir. Yes, I will. <laughs> uh, but um, do you have a collection of rare and unusual antique? Uh, you know, I mean, Ken, we are professors of archaeology, experts in the occult, and uh, obtainers of rare antiquities, as you say. 
uh, and you may know where that quote comes from. And, and drinkers of Crystal Skull vodka. Yes, the fact that you is criminal that I was not on your show on that. Uh, yes, sorry. <laughs> but uh, well, it was just a matter of timing. But that that is a that is of course the the quote from the Army Intelligence guys from Raiders of the Lost Ark. Yes. Um, how do you say it? Rare, rare obtainer of rare antiquities. Well, that's one way of saying it. But uh, do you have a curiosity cabinet uh, with your plastic crystal or plastic moose stone? Listen, dude. I've got a I have a curiosity cabinet with uh, I've got I've, let's say I have Newark holy stones right I know, next. To I, it. I have seen those. I have handled those. Yes. Came out right here. next yes. to my moose stones. Mm-hmm. So they, they're one of the pieces for me. I'm not gonna lie, I'm kind of jealous. Well, um, these are uh, I. A copy could be made <laughs> if you if you want. Well, but you you did mention that you 3D scan them. Are you hosting them somewhere? Um, that is a discussion that is actually also going on, and I don't want to get into it. But uh, I work with my students who are fantastic. <laughs> At this, and they are working on projects that are related to that question. I'm going to leave it there, okay? Because um, they're projects I don't want to kind of unveil them on them, but there's some things. Uh, but what I could do is, if you uh, were interested in getting a copy, I'd be more than happy to snail mail you a print. <laughs> well, so we could we could arrange that uh, off uh, off audio. That's fine. I, I would love to start my own plastic curio cabinet. Oh yeah. my God, Jeb, you you're missing the spectacular financial opportunity to uh, sell these I have, things. Also true. Sell I these have, things online to the the people who believe in the vera- in the the the, um, the reality of these things. Well, now here's the thing. Uh, <laughs> I have already gone down that road with our legal department at the university, and oh, I'm, yeah. not, I'm not I'm not actually joking. I don't want to. I didn't want to do that. Like that's. Um, one of the things that if, if, if you get to know me well, you will realize I'm the world's worst capitalist. I give things away all the damn time. But um, in addition to them being property of the museum here, uh, one of the things I talk about in my culture, art, and artifact, like in all seriousness, this, art, this course is on about ethics. And one of the things with all this, you know, if you think that like Napster, which then turns into torrents for video, which then turns into any number of things, is bad that, you know – Music and movies are digitized. We're now where physical objects are digitized. Right. Oh, my God, that the gates of hell are about to open. Um, and this is a major issue that I actually talk about at length in my course on culture, art, and artifact about IP, about that everything is a remix, about all these issues. So we have actually gone to our legal department and discussed what are the copyright implications of 3D mm-hmm. scans of objects. And, uh, and actually... I'm not going to get into it, but one of the ways to get out of the clear is to bring money into it. So, yeah. so no, because I mean, at one point, the, 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 there have been discussions of things, and we were never going to do anything like that. But, but, <laughs> but no, we've actually had these talks with our legal department about that. Uh, and and so, as much as it's an appealing idea, it actually gets to the serious issue of intellectual property, cultural yeah. heritage. National rights. I mean, uh, you know, there's all the controversies over Elgin marbles and over this and over that. And 3D doesn't solve them. 3D complicates them. Sure. Yeah. It really does. But that's that's a discussion for another time. No, exactly. Um, exactly. So, uh, final thoughts. So, I mean, so we're kind of, you know, I said earlier that, and I think Jeb brought this up in an email that we've got this cliffhanger story. Where yeah. we've got the background, we understand where these moose stones fit into, you know, kind of the fringe literature and the claim of lost continents and people who are reincarnated Maya princes and, and princesses, but we still don't have the the results of the micro of the microscopy, and so we are kind of here waiting. Uh, with bated breath for what those results are going to be, which is why we need a second. Um, podcast on these stones. Yeah. Now, now I'm going to ruin your cliffhanger. I'm going to say on the one hand, cliffhanger. Very cool idea. On the other hand, one of the things I kind of want to sort of make very clear, and I think this very much fits into what the podcast has been doing, is this is going to give us one more piece of evidence. Real life is not CSI, okay? Real life is not, if I run a test, truth with a capital T will be resolved, 
real life is, look, I've got this piece of evidence, and I have this piece of evidence, and I have this piece of evidence, and we have levels of certainty and levels of doubt and levels of interpretation. So I fully don't think this is going to tell me, like, I don't, this is not even testing whether these are made in the 20s or not. I feel comfortable on that. But this is going to be giving me more evidence. Oh, are they cut with stone? Are they cut with iron? Do they have pigments that are made of coconut, which is a, an organic pigment? Do they have pigments with, uh, with metal, metals from industrial processes? Is there some other thing that I'm not even in, expecting that will blow my mind? Sure. That's not going to answer the question. That's going to get us more information that's going to get us closer to where a question could be addressed. Right. And that's how we, the real world works. Yeah. It's the, it's the, the concept of the convergence of evidence so that yes. any one piece of it, it it's just a, is a small piece of the puzzle. It's, it's when all of the various avenues or channels of evidence are all pointing in exactly the same direction. We are more confident of the conclusions that we draw. And right. if this is yet another, another, another avenue or another channel of evidence that says, hey, look, these, these things clearly are not authentic and clearly not ancient, that it's, 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 it, we are more confident when we, we're already pretty confident these things are fakes, but this just will either confirm that or, like you said, it could blow your mind entirely and we'll find out that there's alien DNA um, stuck in the interstices of little pieces of the stone. Now, and if I find that, somebody owes me a bloody tenure track position. I'm just <laughs> saying that right <laughs> off the bat. And, uh, and a show on the History Channel. Well, now, hey, I don't have a degree in uh, sports event management. I'll just <laughs> leave that unnamed. Yeah, uh, but what I will say is this, is this reality puts us at two disadvantages. The first disadvantage is the, oh my God, we have test results. This answers everything. Fits media narratives. Like that's how the right. movies and TV work. And the fact that it's not how the real world work doesn't really matter when you're trying to convince people of stuff. So we're already at a disadvantage in that regard. The second disadvantage is, listen to what I just said. I can't tell you exactly what happened because I'm not there, but I can give you evidence. I can give you forensic data, but it's only going to get us so far. Everything I'm saying is wiggle worm and doubt <laughs> and vagueness because that's how real investigation happens. If I am being honest, I am always going to have room for uncertainty. My favorite example of that was, and this kind of gets into what we talked about, the Large Hadron Collider. And I don't know if I told this story last time, but too bad. Um, <laughs> the Large Hadron Collider is an awesome piece of equipment looking at the building blocks of reality. But there were a couple people who sued to try to get it to not open up because they were convinced that it was going to open up either a portal to hell or, or they were actually convinced it was going to create a black hole and kill us all. And one of the people that was a spokesperson for CERN and creating the Large Hadron Collider was like, well, no, that's, that's not going to happen. Though I can't say that for certain. I mean, after all, anything could happen. I mean, for all I know, we could open it, we could start it up, and like dragons could pop out. And my very first okay. thought was like, okay, you need to tell me more about these dragons. <laughs> and, and, I mean, and that's a serious, you know, because we talk in vagueness and we never say, we never say never because we work in probabilities, percentages, and uncertainties because we are super careful. And that inherently handicaps us in terms of like debates and rhetoric. It helps us when we actually care about reality. And so when I get these tests back, it's not going to say this, that, or the other is true. It's going to be like, this is what it shows. Now what can we do with this? Right. So okay. it is a cliffhanger, but it don't is. expect truth of the capital T. Okay. <laughs> Well, Jeb, thank you very much for coming yeah. on to the show. Absolutely we'll fascinating. definitely have you back yeah. when you get your results. Fascinating, Jeb. Thank you guys, Jeb. Thank you guys cool. for having me. And good luck in in uh, in Denver. Is it Denver? Yeah. Yes. And uh, Yes, good luck in Denver. Yes. Hopefully right. no Lemurians will show up to your talk to dispute <laughs> your findings. Now, that's the thing. If I was going to Mount Shasta, this would be a whole other story. Oh, yeah, and, absolutely. And, ho and hopefully the Ascended Master Sasquatch will not come after me, but that's a whole other story. Yes. No, we don't. Fantastic. Right, you guys. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. And right. I'll talk to you later. Thank you guys. Yes. Bye. Raise your trials as one will call. No, we don't do a dinosaur. The show is produced by Chris Webster and Tristan Boyle and was edited by Chris Webster. 
Thanks for listening. We hope you've enjoyed it. Our music was provided by Archeosuit Productions. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe and rate us on iTunes or Stitcher and share us wherever you use social media. You can contact us with your questions, comments, or angry email at archiefantasies at gmail.com. You can follow the podcast at www.archaeologypodcastnetwork.com slash archiefantasies. You can follow the blog at www.archiefantasies.com and get updates on Tumblr and Twitter at Archiefantasies. You can also look for us on Facebook. If you're looking for the show notes for this episode, go to the podcast website at www.archaeologypodcastnetwork.com slash Archiefantasies. Thanks again for listening. No, we don't do dinosaurs. No, we don't do dinosaurs. We don't do dinosaurs! This has been a presentation of the Archaeology Podcast Network. Visit us on the web for show notes and other podcasts at www.archaeologypodcastnetwork.com. Contact us at chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com.